Elizabeth, thank you. Great show. We'll see you tomorrow. Tonight here on the Hill, Tim Walls talking tough. His first appearance out on the campaign trail by himself, standing up for his military record amid questions regarding his story. And in moments here on this show, you will hear the first response from Donald Trump's campaign. Plus, Kamala Harris. Is she more progressive than Joe Biden? Tonight, the president asked that very question as Harris's team tells us when she will finally unveil her economic platform. Also tonight, new numbers you have never likely seen before. Decision Desk HQ with the breakdown beyond the polls. Which party is gaining and losing voters in the key swing states? And if you thought the Biden-Harris switch was seismic, did you see what happened today with Starbucks and Chipotle? Huge story there. Hello from Washington, our brand new studio here on The Hill. I'm Blake Berman. Thanks for being with us tonight. This is The Hill on News Nation. All right, come on in to our studio. New one on The Hill. Same show, new set as we are just 84 days until November 5th. Tonight, for the first time, Tim Walz defending his own honor. Kamala Harris is vice presidential candidate in his first solo appearance talking to union members in California. And he did not dodge the issue that has raised questions about the sincerity and veracity of his own military service. I'm going to say it again as clearly as I can. I am damn proud of my service to this country. And I firmly believe you should never denigrate another person's service record. Anyone brave enough to put on that uniform for our great country, including my opponent, I just have a few simple words. Thank you for your service and sacrifice. Now, here are the facts as we know them. Wall served 24 years in the Army National Guard, first enlisting as a kid. He was just 17 years old. In early 2005, he began to run for Congress. Walls officially then retired from the Army National Guard in May of that year. And two months later, his unit learned it would soon deploy in the war on terror to Iraq. However, questions about that timeline have followed the former congressman turned governor throughout his entire career. For example, Military.com reports in part, quote, Walls retired two months before his unit received official orders for a deployment to Iraq in 2005. Though it's possible, they say, Walls could have known a deployment order was imminent because he was in a senior enlisted position. Now, those ambiguities have now forced uncomfortable moments upon the Harris campaign. For example, last week it had to update Walls' service record on his biography, as there were questions about his official rank when he retired. The Trump campaign, via Senator J.D. Vance, who served as well, has accused Walls of, quote-unquote, stolen valor. When Tim Waltz was asked by his country to go to Iraq, you know what he did? He dropped out of the army and allowed his unit to go without him. Now, tonight, Walls is trying to put any and all questions to rest. Joining me tonight here on the Hill, Mick Mulvaney, former Trump White House chief of staff, News Nation contributor as well. Scott Bolden, former chairman of the D.C. Democratic Party, News Nation political contributor. Aaron Perini is a Republican strategist. And Kurt Bardella, Democratic strategist, News Nation contributor as well. Hello to you all. Nice to have you all in. First time in this new studio. Yeah. Yeah. You're a, you've, you've been time. here before. Second I'm a veteran time. Veteran now. It's veteran. It's just good to, <laughs> the second time. Caroline Sunshine from the Trump campaign joining us any moment when that happens. We will put the questions before her. Mick, you've known Tim Walls well. You yeah. served serve with him in Congress, I believe. What about him having to come out today to defend this? What did you hear there? And do you think it is smart? for the Trump campaign to go after him on this issue. Uh, It's the first time I've seen that timeline laid out like that. I'm trying to reconcile that with what I've heard from other folks, people that have served with Tim Walls that said that they thought what he did was appropriate, and people that have served with Tim Walls that say they thought what he did was inappropriate. I'm sort of struggling with what the facts are. Welcome to the 21st century (laughs) when it comes to (laughs) truth. We try try to lay it out there. That's exactly right. So... You know, my gut is knowing Tim is that Tim is not the kind of guy that would lie about this. But facts are facts, and I want to know what the facts are. There's other information out there where he says that, you know, he was at Bagram Air Force Base. Well, was he there as a member of Congress, or was he there as a, as a member of, uh, of the Army National Guard? It, stolen valor is a big deal. It, it just is. I think we all agree on that. 
if that's what this is, then it's a big deal. If that's what it's not, then that, we need to be clear and say, look, that's not what this is. Um, right. This is just different interpretations of different facts. Hold that thought for a second. We'll get you all in here in a second. Caroline Sunshine, Trump campaign spokesperson, hooked up with us now. Caroline, thanks for being back with us here on the Hill. Appreciate the time as always. Nice to see you as always. You probably heard the comments there from Tim Walls today. Do you take him at his word? Does your campaign take him at his word? You'll have to remind me of those comments. I wasn't able to hear you earlier. So will you tell me what those are? And I'd be happy to respond. He basically defended uh, Caroline, his service. Mm -hmm. saying we should thank anyone who has served. He basically made a nod to J.D. Vance, uh, saying, I thank you for your service. And he tried to put it all to rest, saying he is damn proud of his service. As you know, your campaign has gone after um, his record and and saying it is, quote, unquote, stolen valor. And now that he's trying to put it behind him, I wonder if your campaign thinks this issue is over or not. Yeah, well, it's not just us that's saying that. It's actually, I believe, Tim Awals' former battalion commander. And look, actually, J.D. Vance addressed this over the weekend on the Sunday shows, um, and he addressed it better than I ever could, obviously having been somebody who served himself in uniform and one who actually did deploy to the Middle East when our country asked him to do so, rather than stepping down to run for office like a career politician like Tim Awals. But I'll say this. you know, this Is that the, the nickname issue. you're going to try to hang on him? I've, I've heard you say it twice now. I think it's fair. I, I think it's fair. Uh, Tim, you know, when he was asked to answer our nation's call to service, he chose not to deploy and he chose to step down and run for office. And where I take issue with that and where a lot of Americans take issue of that is that that's not what we ask of our men and women in uniform. And where I also take issue with it is that Tim Walls stepped down right before his unit deployed during the 2005 troop surge in Iraq. Many members of his battalion did deploy. Many of them were under 21 years old and actually gave their lives. So I do take issue with that. I do think it's a dereliction of duty. But I will say, this isn't about uh, a record of service. That's not what it's about. J.D. Vance, as I said, addressed this over the weekend. It's just about honesty. It's about, it's about integrity. It's, it's an honesty issue. It's not a record of somebody's <laughs> service issue. And Tim Walz has repeatedly misrepresented that. And he's a career politician this, who chose to step an, down and run for office is this an rather issue? than deploy with his unit. Uh-huh. Is this an issue that your campaign will continue to pursue? I think it's an issue that's important to the American people. And I don't think we have a liberal mainstream media in this country that does a decent job of uh, holding those running for office, especially on the Democrat side, to account. I wish the liberal mainstream media would have Tim Walz and Kamala Harris sit down to address this on the record, hold a press conference, do a sit-down interview. I don't think any of those things are happening soon. So this is fair game. I think it's an important point that speaks to somebody's integrity, to somebody's character. It's important to the American people. And if it's important to the American people, our campaign will keep talking about it. Let me ask you about where the race stands, Caroline, because it is it is unquestioned if you look at the polls that this is a different race now than where it was a month or so ago. Swing state polling, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, it shows Kamala Harris leading Donald Trump. Uh, Our DDHQ polling average shows Uh, Kamala Harris up one nationally over Donald Trump. Why is that the case as you see it? Well, I think those are a series of polls, but I would also point to other polls like that from CNBC and Rasmussen and Trafalgar that I think actually have a little bit of a better record of predicting predicting accuracy in the polls. I think a lot of those polls that you're seeing, those pollsters should have been fired in 2016 when they got it fundamentally wrong. So what we're seeing is the opposite, that President Trump actually is leading in battleground states. And that is because President Trump is on the right side of all of the issues that are most important to the American people, which no matter that the Democrat Party has changed its nominee, the facts remain. The issues most important to the American people are immigration, inflation, and the economy. And they trust President Trump most on those issues. And they don't trust somebody, a flip-flopper like Kamala Harris, for example, in Pennsylvania, who has said in the past she wants to ban fracking once and for all, now flip-flopping on that position. That also speaks to integrity. That also speaks to somebody's character. President Trump said it best in Pennsylvania just a couple of weeks ago, actually, when he said this election is about fake, fake, fake versus fight, fight, fight. Caroline Sunshine, Trump campaign spokesperson. Uh, Thanks for being back with us here on The Hill. Appreciate the time. Talk to you soon. Thanks for having me. You got it. All right. So I I, I heard you laughing, and I know why, because you're going to talk about integrity and Trump. So we'll get there in a second. (laughs) It's like you were a Jedi or something. I I knew where you were going with that. Um, (laughs) Is it smart, yes or no? Is it smart for them to go down this line? Because now they're trying to stick a nickname. Here's the risk that they run. If they're wrong, it it backfires. But they're right to say that the media is not going to do it. That I agree with. There's not that many networks talking about it. It's us and maybe one other that's actually talking about it. Everybody else is trying to shove it under the rug. 
so they're right to pursue the issue. But if they make a big deal out of it and they're wrong, it may backfire on them. I think that Senator Vance did a really good job on the Sunday shows over the weekend saying we're not trying to dishonor his service. That's not what we're doing here. What we're talking about are the facts of his service and what are perceived embellishments of that service. That's completely fair to litigate. And I think VP to VP, that's a good place for them to be. That, that, it shows that Vance is being the fighter that Trump needs it to be. Let him have that fight. With Michael Walsh, we don't need to have but the rest in, of the campaign do it. But inherent in raising the question is an attack on his service. Don't Regardless do of what you JD. think, it is. Listen, tell me the lie. Tell me, tell me where the integrity issue is. Because if he if he they've went to run had, for they've Congress, already had to change his, yeah. they've already had to change his bio. There's questions about where he was. Unless you're going to prove <laughs> him a liar or that he purposely lied about something, or that he, as a human being, lacks credibility, so, then I don't think, I don't think this dog of, is going to hunt. Some of this isn't new. The difference is yeah. when you're running for Congress and when you're running for governor, it's much different than when, when you're running for Mick a heartbeat away from the presidency. Um, yeah, that I agree with. You, you, so you want them to make the integrity argument. Uh, I think that it's hilarious for Donald Trump, of all people, to make a case about integrity and truthfulness <laughs> and credibility when this is someone who flagrantly lies and has at best a casual relationship with the truth on just about every, every time he opens his mouth, every press conference he has, every time he answers a question, he lies. And there's a big difference in knowingly saying something that is false mm -hmm. over and over and over again. And saying something that is an embellishment, like, I'm willing to go, like, maybe he embellished. Okay, like, I'll give you that. And, and, and he shouldn't do that. And he's correcting that. And that's fine. But for these people to sit up there, and even in her response, she lied about him. She is saying he knew he was going to be deployed and left the service. That is factually untrue. That has not been proven. The timeline that... It has, not been, not, it has not, not been proven. It's not been proven. And like the military, you go through the, the military, right, you go through the military.com article, as I, as I read there, and they sort of raise the... The, the question. They, they say, right. they say he no. could have them. Well, okay, he could is a no, very not, interesting question. But that's but, but going out there here, and that's where people really do get in trouble. And this is a a rookie mistake by some candidates and campaigns where you talk in definitives. I can't tell you how many fact checks I've had to work when you use a declarative and a definitive, and you didn't mean to be as verbose as you were, but you have to backpedal because they'll slam well, you. Where's right. the lie, though? Let's say he knew that he was going to be deployed, and he filed paperwork to run for Congress either before or after he knew. Tell me the lie that means that people shouldn't vote for uh, the Harris team because he ran for Congress. He ran for public service. Tell me where the lie or the lack of credibility is versus a clarification or an there, embellishment. I think the embellish argument that. there would be leaving his... The argument there would, uh, be, leaving, would be leaving the service. And, and what's then, a lie then, then about not, that? He left well, the no, then, then it's not a lie. Then it's a lie. It's another different, but so it's a different kind of character. So you wanted him to go issue. and be deployed versus running for office let me, as yeah, another former public if he's let, me ask both of you, yes, let me ask okay. both of you this. You yeah. worried there's anything yeah. else out there with him? No. No. No? No, My not what? at all. And this dog won't hunt either. I, I don't think, I think it's a bad argument for the GOP to go down. They need to stick to the issues. And here's another way that they're on the attack about someone's record. And it... It just, it, it, it doesn't matter. I think it's, right? it's, okay. I think it's legitimate to raise questions. I think where they get in trouble is they always go just one step too far with the character assassination. Sir. The question is, is this the last thing to come out about him? The answer is nobody yeah. knows. Because mm. the level of scrutiny, there, there are people sitting in their basements right now, right, on both the right and the left, going through every one of these candidates okay. with, with history with a fine-tooth comb. All right, still come here on the Hill. You see numbers all the time about the changing landscape of the 2024 race. But... I'm going to show you some that you have likely never seen before. I, I think I'm decently confident in saying that and how it could be the key as well to the Keystone State. Plus, now we know who is speaking when at the DNC. Are Barack Obama and Bill Clinton getting a bigger moment than Joe Biden? We'll share the schedule. And he is only 18. Yet he's probably one of the most well-known teens in this entire country. Baron Trump. Could he be an X factor in the election? Mick Mulvaney has some interesting thoughts on this one. We'll, we'll ask him about it later in the show. Might he be in the Oval if Trump wins? You're watching The Hill. Stay with us. All right, welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. 84 days away from the general election, nearly one month from National Voter Registration Day on September 17th. Currently, as many as one in four Americans are not registered to vote. We've talked about polling a lot here on the Hill, but in real time, the election results could potentially come down to voter turnout and party affiliation as well. 
Joining us now, Scott Trainer, Data Science Director at Decision Desk HQ. What's up, my man? Good to see you. We talk numbers all the time. You folks put out some numbers that I found fascinating, and I wanted to tick through them with you real quick. These are voter registration totals over the last four years, so basically voting day uh, in 2020 to now. And let's start with the state of Pennsylvania. You can see in Pennsylvania, Democrats have lost roughly 330,000 registered voters from then until now, though Democrats still have about 350,000 more registered in that state. Let's go to Nevada. Again, Democrats have lost 80,000 registered voters compared to about 23,000 among Republicans. Over to Arizona, Democrats have lost 182,000 compared to 53,000 Republicans. And then in North Carolina, again, we're doing swing states here, they've lost 221,000, whereas Republicans have gained. What's going on here, Scott? So the big takeaway here is people don't like parties, right? They're moving to other. And let's <laughs> is that what, what it is? People, people want to move to other. Other is basically, hey, I'm going to vote for Republican, Democrat, or maybe someone else, depending on who it is. I no longer identify with this party. Now, they're moving a little bit faster away from Democrats and Republicans, but the big takeaway is most people are like, I don't like any of these guys. Right. I'm going to be independent. Um, let's put up the Pennsylvania numbers because... Favorite state. It, well, favorite maybe most important. Yeah. Right. Um, so Democrats have lost 320,000 voters for Republicans, or at least, nope, uh, party affiliation. Uh, let's put up, put up the other one, uh, because this shows the changes over time. Republicans basically flat, uh, and it's been a big shift for Democrats. What does this mean in that state? Well, this means that every vote counts, right? So last time Joe Biden won the state by about a point and a half, two points. We think that state's going to be that close as well. So that means a couple hundred thousand votes can determine who wins Pennsylvania. And as of this morning, our model shows that whoever wins Pennsylvania, most likely going to be the next president. Really? So win that state, and that's, that's kind of it. Yeah, because it's correlated with everything else. All right, DDHQ polling. Uh, let's look <laughs> at that, where things are right now. Uh, when you look at basically a, a five-way race. Kamala Harris up by 4.2, I believe. You rounded up to 48. Donald Trump at 43. RFK Jr. at 3. What do you see there, Scott? What's going so on? So what I see is this sea change. We were having this conversation a month ago. It was much closer with Donald Trump either tied or ahead in the average. You know, Kamala Harris really coming on strong. The other thing, Robert F. Kennedy, we had this discussion a month ago. He was at 7 or 8. He's really fallen off the table there. Scott Trainer. Data Science Director at DDHQ. Scott, hello from, uh, or thank you, from over here at the Curve Wall. Thank you, sir. Talk to you soon. Thank you. All right. Bardella, Perini, mm -hmm. we went through the numbers there. Democrat, Republican, ladies first. What's your takeaway there? I think there are a couple of things that need to be looked at there. One, you need to look at states like Pennsylvania and North Carolina because a lot of people can register there without registering to party. So there are a lot of independent voters that are coming on board now in some of these key swing states. That's the persuadable voting block we're always talking about when mm -hmm. it comes to who you're pitching your message to. And if you're a Republican and you're seeing some of these numbers right now, if I am the RNC or the campaign, I'm going to start putting rallies in those cities and start building events around them to use them as voter registration events. So um, we'll, we'll get to Florida in a second. Um, but are you worried about this? Because I just went through hundreds of thousands in, in several states. Now, granted, in, in Pennsylvania, it still, you know, leans Democrat on, on the voter rolls. But I, you see that? Does it concern you? It doesn't, because I think that if the race had stayed Biden and Trump, I think that would be incredibly concerning. And I think what we've seen in these numbers is a byproduct of the dissatisfaction that we had really with both top of the ticket candidates. That's why there are so many jumps in the independents or the decline of states or the non-party affiliates. That's why those numbers are up through the roof everywhere. Is that going to get pinned on her, though? Because you could make the argument, right, there's demographics, people move during COVID. But I wonder how much of that is... I saw the administration and maybe I'm going well, somewhere else. What I'm more interested in is the numbers that we're going to have between July when this announcement happened that Kamala became the top of the ticket through the fall. And everyone knows that in campaigns, the biggest voter registration pushes happen in the fall after Labor Day. That's when you're doing the most aggressive push where all the resources are going to identifying your voters, registering your voters, and getting them to do I hope contact. Democrats start identifying their voters in the fall. You'll be so <laughs> far behind the game. It'll be so great for us. There was a big story today out uh, that Donald Trump's lead in Florida is, is just down to a handful, right? Yeah. And we found this instructive. So here's what's going on in Florida, right? If you look at the, the actual total of registered voters, that's the context in all these states, like I just mentioned with Pennsylvania. In Florida, look at the bottom there. 5.3 million, give or take Republicans, 4.3 million, give or take Democrats. So no matter what the polls show, that's the climb 
for Democrats in, in the state that you know well. Well, you know, it's really fun because Democrats, the Florida Democrat Party put out a release about these numbers saying, oh, well, there are about 866,000 Democrats that are inactive on the voter rolls but can vote on election day. So for Democrats, they're saying that these numbers are much tighter than they are anyways just because of inactive voters. And so, yes, this will be a tight race. It's not going to be the 19 points DeSantis won by yeah. mid, mid-cycle mid years. Looking right. at 22 is different than 24. But those numbers are tighter, even according to the Democrats. So, of course, the race is going to be Last word here. Hey, you know what? I actually agree with Aaron hey! on this. How about that? Party line. No, I, I, I agree. Florida is an uphill climb for Democrats. Florida is like this white elephant that Democrats Texas, have been chasing forever. Right. And it's not like they are much better Democrats. As a Democrat, much better serve focusing. If you want to flip places, look at North Carolina. Don't look at Florida. You can say that with Republicans in New York and New Jersey. Yeah, and yeah, all yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm change. from New but, York. We're not, we're not taking that. <laughs> I wanted to show you those numbers because we, we focus on the polls all the time, right? And rightfully so. DDHQ puts that out. And it makes you think about how many voters there are, what the trends and shifts are. Anyway, still to come here from the Hill on News Nation, when is Kamala Harris finally going to unveil how much she might want to have you pay in taxes, for example? Are we getting closer to that answer? We just might be, and we'll share it with you on the other side of the break. You're watching The Hill. All right, welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. Concern continues in the Middle East tonight about a possible imminent attack by Iran against Israel in retaliation for killings by Israel against terrorist targets. Now, President Biden asked about this today, saying in part, quote, we will see what Iran does. He adds that he is not giving up on preventing an attack. The U.S. and its allies are working to avoid Iranian action, warning it would dramatically destabilize the region. No one wants to see escalation. No one wants to see a wider regional conflict. So, you know, hopefully you don't find ourselves in a situation of having to employ those capabilities. Uh, But if we need to in the defense of Israel, we will. Joining us now here on the Hill once again, the Democratic Congresswoman from the state of Ohio, Chantel Brown. Congresswoman, thanks for being back with us here on the Hill. I wonder, um, as as we watch and, and the world waits for what could come in the Middle East, what are you looking for in the upcoming days? Well, thanks for having me back, Blake. Um, I think, as we know, as it was said by the secretary and President Biden, that no one wants to see um, this uh, conflict continue. I had a chance to meet with the families um, before the prime minister uh, gave his speech in Washington last month. And um, the pain that they have experienced is none other Um, like nothing I can um, replicate or even express adequately. So de-escalation is the goal and making sure that we free the hostages um, is the top priority while also supporting Israel's right to defend itself. You you are a a Democrat and a, a strong supporter of Vice President Harris and her run for the White House. There was a story, Congresswoman, that caught my attention earlier today in Politico. This was the headline. It said, quote, progressives jostle for national security jobs under Harris. The liberal activists plan to offer Harris lists of names to consider, but their list last such effort with Biden yielded little successes. Uh, Should we be turning over potentially national security um, and national security jobs to the progressive wing of, of your caucus as you see it? Well, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. One of the things that I can say is that my constituents, when they're in need of services or support, and I would say this is true um, not only of constituents, but as it relates to jobs, the question never comes up if you're a progressive or um, a moderate. People are looking for folks' qualifications to make sure that they are capable of doing the job, and I think that needs to be the highest priority when we are considering um, employment. You have been a um, you've been backed by APAC, uh, which is the pro-Israeli group here in Washington that vouches for for Israel and and its causes. Um, and, and you you know some of the debate that's going on, Congresswoman, uh, within your own party. There were comments, for example, from Bernie Sanders today, saying, "quote It is it is the intimidating presence they have over every member of Congress. It bothers me that there has been hasn't been more outrage." Do you take issue with comments like that? Um, I take issue with the fact that we are having discussions around one particular organization when there are several organizations that really um, fight to 
promote and support their issues. Um, one of the things I think that needs to be important to this, in this conversation is Citizens United. Um, this is a direct result of that. And so when we consider the rules which we are allowed to campaign, then I think it goes back to whether we support that or not. Um, I think we would all appreciate getting big money out of politics, but because this is the, uh, or the rules that we have to play by, um, then we play by the rules that are given to us. President Biden, on, the, uh, on his way out of the White House today, Congresswoman, was asked about uh, his vice president and her policies about whether or not she is more, back to the term, progressive than him. This was the response he gave. I'll get your reaction on the other side. The issues we've worked on together is big progress, economic. No one calls over here on Maybe hard for you to hear there, but he didn't say yes. He didn't say no. Basically said they've worked together on policy. We're hearing, Congresswoman, that 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 Vice President Harris is going to unveil her her major economic speech later this week. And, And I wonder if you think more of that needs to come. And if so, when and how much? Well, I certainly don't want to get ahead of the vice president, but I do um, anticipate that, um, as I've said in the past, when it comes to policies and elections, they're about the future. But I bet I, I'd lean and say that the best indicator of future behavior is past behavior. And both she and President Biden have been successful um, with putting forth policies that have really helped improve the quality of life of all Americans, whether you're Democrat or Republican, when you consider the fact that we're making investments into the community around repairing roads and bridges. When we're capping prices of insulin at $35 a month and starting next year. Do you want details, though, from her? Uh, senior- I, I, I expect that she will give details. I, I, I suspect that. But again, I wouldn't try to get ahead of the president, uh, vice president, be, as it relates to her policies and plans. And I think it's important to note that she's uh, she's well covered by uh, a gaggle of press every, at every campaign stop. So I anticipate and expect um, that we will get more details as it relates to um, Vice President Harris's uh, policy plans and agenda. Chantel Brown, Congresswoman, Democrat from Ohio. Thanks for being back with us here on The Hill. Talk to you again soon, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you, Blake. Mm -hmm. You got it. Um, That story today, progressives jostle for for national security jobs under Harris, caught my attention this morning. It notes that that part of of your party, Scott, under, under Joe Biden, under Bill Clinton, hasn't really been in that apparatus. And it seems like the pressure campaign is now just going to begin. Is there something wrong with being progressive? I'm not saying there is or isn't. serve in, in those security Although you capacities? Were, you, he was shaking his head. I'm going to get to him in a second. That, your question to the congressman suggested that somehow progressives are unqualified to serve in these security oh, I didn't, I didn't, positions. I didn't suggest I they were the unqualified. Question, well, you said, should they be in these security positions, which begs the question... Are they, is there something that's disqualifying about them because they want to cease fire or because they have a certain view on foreign policy? At least it, 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 it would sound like that. I think they have every right to apply for these jobs. If they're qualified and capable, then we ought to give them those jobs, despite their political viewpoints being on the far left. Look, they're progressives in the national security structure right now. I mean, yeah. look at, look at, look at the, the protests by the State Department employees mm-hmm. during work hours in front of the White House <laughs> against the Biden uh, policy. Right. Sounds like a Gaza. former chief of staff no. talking. <laughs> no, no, wait, let's, listen, they're progressives. This is, we have a larger, larger conversation yeah. about the deep state, but sure, there are people in these positions already who have very progressive attitudes. You were shaking your head, though. Uh, I'm not a, I think ultimately the only thing that matters when you're looking at jobs of national security, defense, diplomacy, are you qualified for right. that position, sure. will you do the best job? I, I, I could care less if you're overtly progressive, but I will tell you this. If there was a story out from Politico today that said right-wing conservatives are angling for progressives would be losing their mind. Oh, I mean, you could, <laughs> right. I, I heard a lot of talk about Fair Project enough. 2025 and, and heritage, right. and that, that, that's the other side of it, we is had, it not? And I'm, we had non-interventionalists in the White House, me, Okay, and then we had as neocon as you can get with John Bolton. I mean, right. we had everybody across the spectrum. What's wrong with that? I, okay. get, I, I, I get it. And I, think I get the pushback. I get the politics. I understand of it, that staff definitely can have a role where they can push back, but ultimately you work at the service of the president or the vice president. So while you exactly. may have progressive policies and progressive ideologies, that cannot supersede that's right. what right. the president is trying to pursue. And right. that's what Donald Trump talks about when he talks about the deep state, that's is right. that there are people that are entrenched into these, some of these agencies, including the national security apparatus, who, because of their ideology, 
try to do the work opposite of what he was pursuing as president. Remember Ron Dellums, though, a very progressive congressman from Oakland, California. He chaired the Armed Services Committee when the Dems were in control, and he was as progressive as they could, and he got high marks for leading that committee and working with the administration. Where do you think she would be in the spectrum on foreign policy? I think she's going to be uh, right down the middle. And if she's going to be a pragmatist because she has to be now that she's a decision. Yeah, I, she wins. I think with the ongoing conflicts in Ukraine and the Middle East, she has to be more pragmatic than ideological. Okay. Got it. All right, still but to come. Not an isolationist. All right, still to come here. Don't make Mulvaney. Mulvaney's <laughs> 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 probably oh. set on that. Oh. Cute shot as we head oh, to the wow. commercial break. He gets he, as uh, we go out to the break. He's <laughs> 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 he's trail, but speaking of Mulvaney, he's going to give us his thoughts on Barron Trump. What's going on <laughs> with Barron and what possible role could he play? going forward if his father is reelected. Plus, you know how Democrats swapped out Biden for Harris, or Harris for Biden, rather? Well, Wall Street now has a major flip of its own. Did you see what happened today involving two major giants, Starbucks and Chipotle? Billions of dollars at play today. Two restaurants you're probably no stranger to. We'll explain what happened there when The Hill returns. Did you see what happened today with two of the biggest brands in the world? Starbucks swooping in to steal Chipotle CEO, sending the stocks in complete opposite directions. (laughs) Starbucks was up over 24% today. Keep in mind, this is a $100 billion company, while Chipotle, again, a massive company, dropped over 7%. In all, you can have a market cap swing here of give or take $27 billion. We hit for context here. $4 $4 billion in total ad spend in the election today. That is 7x in market cap in one day. That, those, are, those are big food numbers. And I got to tell you, this sounds delicious. This guy used to work at Taco Bell, Taco Bell, Starbucks, Chipotle. I, I got to tell you, this is my dream. I really messed up going into the, politics. The, the, the CEO <laughs> Brian, really messed up. CEO Brian Nichol, could you imagine trying to keep this under wraps? Yeah, like, really, including with the number of lawyers on the number, of, yeah. without a doubt and stuff. But I... I've certainly frequented all of those restaurants and stuff from my waistline, so this is, I like this move. These are, these are two companies that I think if you check your credit card bill, uh, you got it. it somewhere or multiple of those line items. But, you know, the Laxman move is really interesting because he was handpicked yeah. by the former uh, owner, uh, whose Howard name Schultz, is yeah. Howard Schultz right Schultz. now. And so he must have, it been, must have been a lot of negative Let me tell you, it was, it was stock. Yeah, over, they over weren't the going. Their numbers. You know that I used to be a competitor at Chipotle, right? I didn't. You know oh, that well, I was you used to own you used to own restaurants. Yeah, Mexican, Mexican South restaurant. Carolina. Better for Chipotle. I, so I loved it when they did poorly. Did you? Did you <laughs> what was it called? <laughs> Salsaritas Fresh Cantina. You can still eat at one of the Charlotte. Salsaritas. Really? Salsaritas. Ah, right, count me in. There you go. Mulvaney We're going with Nick. Mulvaney regales us with uh, chief of staff stories during the commercial. You got to get him on social <laughs> media at some point. But there you go. Now we learned something new about Nick. All right. So one of the issues that has been a big deal for the for the White House and and now really for Kamala Harris is grocery prices, right? Speaking of food, but polls consistently naming that a top issue and showing uh, that many voters used to blame President Biden for soaring prices. It was one of the topics that Donald Trump and Elon Musk, for example, discussed on X last night. The thing that they really is making them angry is what Kamala and Biden have allowed to happen to the economy. It's a disaster with inflation. The inflation, it doesn't matter what you make. The inflation has eaten you alive. But has there been a shift? Recent poll, which asked voters who they trust more to handle the economy. Look at that number. A dead even split. Harris up one. She's not being blamed for the Biden inflation issue. And that poll and watch for more to come. Uh, And if I was a GOP, I'd be concerned about that. One, is that a one-off? Do you think is that a moment in time or at the end of the day are people going to go into voting booths and be like, I remember what happened? No, I think that you have to remember that for the better part of three years now, billions of dollars have been spent defining and tying Joe Biden specifically right. to inflation and the economy in this country. Well, he country. tried to do it himself, Bidenomics, yeah. right? Like, yeah, and that, which we all know how that turned yeah, out. Right. Uh, so no matter which end of the spectrum you were of this, 
it, it had nothing to do with Kamala Harris, frankly, in terms of the messaging and the amount of exposure that it got. That's bleeding over right now in a positive way for Kamala. I mean, normally, it wouldn't be great if, well, the vice president wasn't really a part of that economic issue at all. But in this case, it's actually a positive with the voters, at least right now. Where's the worry for you? Listen, the economy is something that Republicans should do well on. This is one poll. If we start seeing more, it's, it's got to be more than just a one-off. It's got to sure. be a bit more trend-worthy for me to start getting worried. But this is something I said very early on when Kamala was now installed as the nominee, was that they needed to be tying her to the disastrous Biden policies, and they needed to do it quickly. It needed to be the border. It needed to be the economy. And that polling is showing they might have so missed it. Mulvaney sent me a text yesterday, and he was, and you were like, I think this is a big deal. For exactly the reason Aaron just mentioned. This is going to be the number one issue in the, in the election. It usually is, and it's supposed to be a place that Republicans should be up five or ten points. Yeah. By the way, there's no way this has anything to do with her position on the economy, though, because right. she doesn't have one. Right. She's going to be giving that speech on Friday. That's exactly right. This is, about, this is an overall sort of feeling about the race, so it doesn't surprise me that it's sort of tracking the other numbers. But what, what, what's really interesting even more is that the American voter in all of this polling has said they didn't want Trump or Biden to run. And Biden has stepped aside. What you're seeing, I think, is Kamala being that new face, that new voice, and she's not getting blamed for the Biden economy because they're starving for leadership and starving for a new face. So Democrats just got to it before the Republicans will. As someone who has advised Donald Trump, you used to do it often. Yeah. What would you tell them now? Do exactly what Aaron talked about. They need to move quickly. If they do not define her in the next 30 or 40 days, they're going to lose the opportunity to do that. They've lost the next 10 days because of the convention, right? There's right. no way you can't, there's no oxygen left. So, so they're going to have that period from the end of August to the middle of September to define her as, it stri- I don't know what the word is, but it's her inflation. It strikes me as Trump's former chief of staff says do exactly what Trump's former <laughs> spokeswoman says to do. And so the question is, can he do it? Nope. Uh, he's going to do exactly what he wants. He's yes. his own chief of staff and his own campaign uh, uh, chief. So right. Maybe, well, maybe undiscipl- spending all of this time talking about Tim Waltz's military record or talking about women or talking about grievances or talking about how you don't like the media and not doing their job is not the best use of your oxygen when all this should be coming out of your mouth if you are a Republican right now is the economy inflation. Yeah, but Aaron's yeah, right that here. the vice president, that, that's the right thing for J.D. Vance to be doing. It's a, it's yeah, a vice this president, is good. vice president. Yes, right. vice president, vice president. Yeah. Meantime, yeah. Donald Trump appears to be trying to fire up Gen Z voters with the help of his son, Barron. Uh, Barron and his friend, the conservative teen influencer, Bo Loud, reportedly helping the former president to meet with online stars, streamers, YouTubers with millions of followers. Their goal is to convince Gen Z voters to get out and vote conservative. Now, the tech-savvy teens reportedly lined up Trump's 90-minute interview last week at Mar-a-Lago with the internet celebrity and live streamer Aiden Ross. Trump reports more than 500,000 viewers watched the live stream uh, and he also says more than 100 million, 100 million total listened. Who knows about the actual numbers? But here's that might be a lie. Here's what here's what I'm interested in. Baron Trump. He's 18. He's not a kid. He's very young. He's an adult. What's his future? And what is his future if Donald Trump wins? Let me tell you a story about Donald Trump. It okay. goes back to the 1970s, 1980s. He was trying to buy a restaurant in Manhattan out of bankruptcy. He went to sort of kick the tires when it was closed, bumped into a couple of busboys or folks who worked in the kitchen. And he asked those people, the lowest people in the totem pole, what, why did this restaurant go bust? And he changed exactly what they said they, he should change. And it was a huge success. And I think that was a formative sort of experience for him. He still does it. I've seen him wear Bagram Air Force Base in, in Afghanistan. He's asking an 18-year-old enlisted, enlisted man, what do you think we should be doing? Why do you think we're here? How do you feel about this, et cetera, et cetera? He's always empowered the, the, the youngest, the, 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 the bottom up. weakest, he, he, the body. He's always listened to everybody in the totem pole. He's going to listen to Barron. He's going to reach out to his 18-year-old kid and say, what do 18-year-old kids think about? Give him credit. He's not 18 years old anymore. Trump is not. So asking an 18-year-old how 18-year-olds think is probably not the stupidest thing mm-hmm. he's ever done. All right. Still to come here on The Hill, John Stewart's take on this wild election cycle. Plus, Leland Vitter, host of On Balance, joins us on the other side of the break. You're watching The Hill. All right. Welcome back here to The Hill. So Donald Trump is seemingly having a hard time of letting his old rival go, claiming at rallies and on social media that President Biden will try to get back into the presidential race at the DNC. Last night on The Daily Show, Jon Stewart sent a message to the former president. He's not coming back. He's not coming back, Donald. Hey, you know how I know he's not coming back? We have a camera on him. That's him! (laughs) Trump 
posted this video on X yesterday showing clips of Biden tripping and falling downstairs and showing his old polling numbers against the president. Why is Trump still doing this? That's a little distraction, a little fun, just a little bit of chaos.